Alright, well, welcome back to the Stormwater Creek Podcast. We're sitting here in Fort Worth. Haven't been on this side in a while, and it's getting pretty pretty grown up around here. But we're sitting on Shot Street uh, with Defender Outdoor, man. Uh, Is that done on purpose? Shot, Shot Street? <laughs> no, man. That was totally by luck. If that isn't God telling you what you're, what you're doing is right, I don't exactly. know what it is. Because originally this building's address was on the, the other side on Cullen. Okay. Uh, and then when we realized this was Shot Street, it just made sense to make the retail entrance this side. Absolutely. I think, I think Shots is way better than Cullen. I would agree. Yeah. 100%. No doubt. I didn't even put two and two together. That was Shot Street. I was just following really? the GPS over here. <laughs> was just, so I'm glad you brought that up. Normally we get way more trouble about being Defender Outdoors, but being an indoor gun Yeah, range. oh, I'm sure. What are you outdoors? Uh, pe- people crack me up. Some people are clever, and th- th- you can just tell they're giving a light ribbon, and some people are just idiots like, man, you're Defender Outdoor and you're not indoor outdoor. range. That's lame. It's Texas. You it's guys hot. are stupid. It's the number one line for the bad review. On uh, Yelp or Google or Facebook. Has if that's loved. the bad review of your place, you're, once again, you're well, doing that's pretty like, well. That's like their jab at you. Oh, you know? nice. And when they've got nothing else, they've got to go real basic. Exactly. Place is real nice. I hate basic it, was, it was outdoor. <laughs> it was indoor, cause, except it's called Defender Outdoor. They certainly oh, okay. appreciate it with the 70 degrees inside year-round. The, the ranges are moving yeah. indoors. Everybody should. I mean, it's <laughs> Texas. I don't want to be outside here in about... Two months, a month, I guess. It'll be hot here before the end of May. I guess it's already kind of hot, but 82 is not hot. Dude, I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Hagerman, I don't know what was going on, but it like I got back to the truck, turned on the truck, and looked up. I was like, it's got to be 90 degrees, and it was like 72. And I was like, there's no way it's 72 right now. 72 like, is balmy. Just dude, that oh, and it, well, yeah. well, it was it was it rained a little bit. Like, just hard enough to where you're like, oh, I put my jacket on, you know, get rain jacket up, and, and then it would stop raining and take it off, and the sun would come out, and it would just beat that heat down. It was just like on off, on off, humidity, just crappy. And walking 19 miles probably. Oh, yeah, matter. man. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I like to walk. This might, might be my one of my downfalls of turkey hunting. Is walking around too <laughs> much. Walking around too much. But you're but, scouting for other things. Yeah. Think about if you draw that tag. Get a Hagerman tag. Yeah, now you'll know more about Hagerman. So, or you draw the Hagerman turkey uh, deer tag. Yeah, the hog dude. There was tons of hogs out there. We met with fresh the, piglets. Uh, we met like, the uh, at uh, EarthX yesterday. I met the ranger who is over Hagerman. I was like, shouldn't you be there turkey hunt? She's like, no. <laughs> well, you need to go down here to this unit where there's a guy named Jordan Grimes, and that guy needs to get he needs all the help ribbed. he can get. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, I, I feel like we should introduce our guest. Yeah, for yeah, sure. So um, we're here with Will James, president of Defender Outdoor, and uh, Matt Irwin, who is the ATF NFA compliance manager, as well as the retail guru, king. Yes, sir. Bend the knee. I'm watching a lot of Game of Thrones right now. So. Hashtag king of the north. <laughs> yeah, king of the north. <laughs> oh, man. I just went back and watched the whole thing again, and it's like, it's it's such a good show. We could do an hour on well, Game I'm of Thrones. Just talking through Just <laughs> breaking that down. Um, but we won't. But we won't, yeah. Uh, yeah, because well, we we're here to talk about guns today. Uh, so um, what what got you guys started in this business, and what was the whole impetus of, of creating Defender? And So it's kind of a it, – it's a long story, so we'll do the Cliff Notes yeah. version so we can fit it into the time slot. Uh, we were originally, so our sister company is Defender Supply, which builds cop cars, police pursuit vehicles, police okay. pursuit motorcycles. Um, and that was um, up in Aubrey, Texas, north of Denton. Uh, all the foot traffic in and out of the door, all the departments in and out of the door, all the law enforcement traffic in and out of the door. As interesting as our secretary was, yeah, uh, they wanted something else. Yeah. And so they had posed the idea of why not get an FFL and put some guns in here, you know, let us shop some stuff yeah. while we're getting radar certified while we're getting a wheel and light bar fixed or while we're looking at our new cars and so we ended up hiring some folks who had come from another gun company uh to work for supply and they brought some vendor relationships with them and thus defenderoutdoors.com was born so really our entire business model was originally structured off of an e-commerce platform back in the obama days when the world's best gun salesman by a thousand times was in office. <laughs> uh, e-commerce was booming. And yeah. so we figured we'd jump on that train while we could. 
uh, and the, the small retail store that we had was just because the space was there and, yeah. and the foot traffic was there. The, the goal was never to go put up a bunch of retail stores. Sure. It was to run e-commerce and try to make some money doing it. Uh, and through the evolution of time, right, uh, the office, I mean, well, political things change. Yeah. And the margin on e-commerce gets real thin. And thus, you know, other opportunities start to rear their heads. Yeah. And so we started um, identifying some retail locations. Uh, obviously, uh, many of the principals, my partners, were all from Fort Worth. Okay. And as we were walking around Fort Worth, I mean, where do we go to shop? We're, we're all hunters. We're all fishermen. Yeah. Um, outdoors guys. And we didn't have a great place to go shop uh, here in Fort Worth. And so that was, that was the impetus of us starting a retail store here. We ended up shutting down e-commerce completely. So DefenderOutdoors.com no longer sold anything online. Yeah. Uh, and so we rolled the name. We'd already had the branding and the marketing piece and some of the Google SEO and some of the other things that go along with building a retail business. Sure. And so instead of starting from scratch, we opened this building kind of fell in our lap. Um, and it's a 43,000 square foot um, it's beautiful. building that we retrofit. So it was existing structure. It was already pretty ballistically sound. Okay. And so the actual capital investment to make it a gun range wasn't near as intense as maybe some folks that are in other parts yeah. of the state or other parts of the country that are building from scratch. Because, you know, you know, 10-inch CMU filled walls with rebar reinforcement are not cheap to build. No. Oh, my God. That's I can't even pretty imagine. nice to just have it fall in your lap like oh, that. Oh, like, great. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so that's why but the layout in here doesn't always make sense to everybody. Well, it's because we didn't lay it out this yeah. way. This is the way the building was, and we just made use of the space kind of, um, mm -hmm. that we thought was, like, the best fit for what we were trying to do. Uh, and so back to the – Defender, the birth of Defender Outdoors, yeah. this was our first major step into the retail. And, you know, we normally like to dip our toe in the water before yeah. we dive head first. This was a belly flop from 30 feet, <laughs> right? I and mean, we just dove as fast Let's as we this. could into it. Yeah. Um, and have learned a lot. We're yeah. in our third year of operation here. Um, and every year things are getting better. We're learning wow. more about what our customer wants, what they need, uh, how we price it, where we source it. Um, and so every year is a... Uh, a new good thing for us and that yeah. we're getting better every year. We, we don't, we'll never know it all. Yeah. Right. And I think to be a successful retail store, especially in the firearms industry, if you act like you know it all, your customers aren't coming back. Right. Yeah. So there's nothing scarier than the gun guy that knows everything and yeah. doesn't have any room to learn or get better at something. Yeah. Uh, and so we don't employ them. Yeah. Um, and typically we don't cater to them as a, as a client. Um, we really focus on new shooters, um, folks who have been shooting once or twice, maybe haven't had a bad experience yeah. or haven't been in a long time, um, and women. I mean, they're yeah. the fastest growing segment of our industry, um, and they're wonderful clients to have. Yeah. They're, they're thirsty for knowledge, and they, they take the training classes. We get to sell them their first gun, their first holster, first sight. I mean, everything. Yeah. Um, and so we kind of get to grow with them. As they grow. As they kind of go through the bumps and bruises of right. getting into this thing. And so as we were doing this, we realized, man, when the weather's nice outside, nobody wants to come inside. Yeah. We're busy in the summer. We're busy over the holidays. Yeah. Uh, but this stretch of time right now, March, yes. April, May, June People are just are. dead. Yeah. Um, and so we ended up opening a um, shotgun range, uh, Clay Sports, Defender Outdoors Clay Sports Ranch which is on West Loop, about 10 minutes from this location. Okay. Um, about 160 acres, uh, two full sporting clay courses, a great new five stand. Um, and we partnered with a guy named Travis Mears, who's a world-class shooter uh, and a great guy on top of that. Yeah. And so uh, it's been a match made in heaven. We're about to celebrate one year out there. Um, and then Defender Supply, the cop car building company, just moved their headquarters to Argyle, Texas, okay. and a brand new 60,000 square foot manufacturing facility. And we carved off 3,000 square feet of that for a retail store. Again, more law enforcement focused, but definitely yeah. open to the public. Sure. Um, it's just a smaller sampling of basically what we have here. Yeah. I mean, that's where most of the stuff comes from is like law enforcement or military. And then it kind of filters its way down into the kind of the consumer end right a hundred percent it's yeah. got to be tested and vetted somewhere exactly. right and what better to have confidence in than if if law enforcement Oof. and the military can put it through its paces and it passes yeah it's probably pretty if they good can't to break it consumer <laughs> nobody yeah. nobody can that's right yeah um, they'll find a way to break it yeah they'll find a way to break everything but 
So uh, something I saw, and I just completely just thought about this, like looking over at your range. Did you see the uh, Facebook video of the guy who's like instructing some people, and he goes and he's walking in front of them, and he's like running, and they have to like stop and start. Did you see this on? I saw it last week. It, what, so is there something that you can like from your expertise can say like was that guy just being a moron? Which I mean I thought he was, or was he doing something that? Looks like he's being dumb, but he's really not being dumb because they're like firing blanks or something like that. It's legitimately the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I would never advise anyone to do it, no matter their proficiency level. Um, now, granted, I mean, it really kind of looked like more of a stunt for yeah for social media or for no somebody's doubt. video, you know, to be a joke and wasn't supposed to get out, but yeah. it got out. Um, because, I mean, we've met some really high-class, high-end, uh, very professional yeah. trainers who have incredible backgrounds and five-page resumes. Yeah. And I've never seen him do anything. No like one that. walks in front of them. Never. Yeah. You know, they're not like walking in front of you. Yeah, I mean, uh, while you're shooting. Our whole business model lives and dies on safety. Yeah. So if we don't have it, and we don't. Yeah. Uh, when we don't uh, say or do what we say. Yeah. Then I, I mean, I don't think anybody'd come here if they knew they were coming to a gun range that felt unsafe. And no. If I ever saw that, those people <laughs> would never <laughs> shoot here again. None of our customers will ever get to see that get to see that here it will <laughs> yeah. not happen here i just it was just incredible I, I was watching and i was like this is so dumb but i mean maybe it's something maybe it's something maybe he's doing something and it just appears to be dumb from the outset but no nope, nothing <laughs> nothing like that huh that was as point blank dumb as i've, I've ever seen <laughs> yeah. no offense to those guys or that person and it all they all appear to be law enforcement guys but what are you doing? I would never. I've seen a lot of law enforcement training. I've never seen anybody go in front of the firing line. Yeah, I don't understand even what he would be training. Like, stop and start? Like, shoot, no shoot. Yeah? Essentially, but. is time on target <laughs> when you're not supposed to be shooting versus how fast you can yeah. get a shot off when the, the shot is clear. Okay, right? so like... Could you, snap just, snap. could you just put like a uh, silhouette on like some wheels, like a <laughs> yeah, dolly, and just pull it through? That'd be, a, that'd be exactly maybe a little what you do. Action, <laughs> action target and some other guys. They make really cool popper targets yeah. and steel targets, silhouette targets that do that Yeah, uh, for that exact purpose. Uh, I've never seen it done in With real. With a human yeah, being? Yeah. <laughs> With the With most dangerous game target, of all? Yeah. <laughs> that, that dude loves his job or really hates his job. Just like, oh, it's, I'm, I'm done. You know? Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just thought of that looking at your range. It was just like, maybe he can shed some light and be like, no, but no, just straight up stupid. It's funny. Social media is one of those things that it can, it's either the best thing for our business or the worst thing yeah. or the perfect hybrid of the two. <laughs> yeah. So for as many things as I see that are, are good, putting yeah. good knowledge out there, things that we would want to share with yeah. the public or our customers, I equally see the things I would never want our customers to see, hear, yeah. or think was real. Exactly. Uh, because it can really skew somebody's perception of what, what we do here and what we what our industry does in general. Well, my, I always grew up with the, the – my dad taught me, like, there aren't, there's no such thing as a gun accident, right? They just – if you're doing it right, that just never occurs, right? They just – and if you were watching a video of a safe shooting, it's pretty boring because – all you're doing is shooting, you're stopping, you're doing all the things proper. There's not anything that's making you go, huh, he just walked out in front of somebody, you know. Right. Even uh, if you're doing it right, even if a firearm malfunctions, which yeah. happens, but sure. it's very rare, uh, it, it still is not yeah. going to hurt anybody else. Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the whole goal, right? And that's exactly. really what we push here is trying to, if we minimize the amount of accidents that occur and yeah. knock on wood, we're still in three years without having a, a major sure. accident on range. Um then um, I kind of forgot where I was going with that. But, sure. Uh, if we if we are showing people the right way to do it, and really, if we can reduce the occurrence, yeah, right, just by one, right, we're we're positively impacting the industry. Because exactly. We have a there's a stigma around the firearms industry that I think is drawn from what people see guns do. That video do. on Facebook. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 Silly stuff. Like, I mean, there exactly. were, there's one earlier this year of a range officer who looks like he's training somebody. And they're just, he's talking and messing around, doing what you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Finger on the trigger, loaded firearm, looking away from it, talking to somebody. And this thing goes off and pops him in the face, I, you know. Uh, the reaction of the dude probably, behind him it was um, <laughs> it was the best. He's like, Unbelievable. Oh. Unbelievable. Yeah. And, and I saw another one yesterday of a guy puts his hand in front of the muzzle to show the other person in the stall something and shoots his hand. I mean, if you're not doing that stuff, you're, just, you're not going to get hurt doing it. It's just no ex no reason for that ever. Why would you momentary lapses in judgment? Yeah, just thinking. <laughs> but I, it's it's one of those things where you think you know, 
you know, everything, and you're you're just a you're a, I'm a badass, and <laughs> then you're gonna get hurt. You know, 100%. that's that's typically when that occurs. So, well, that's like the number one thing. Like anytime I have someone that's learning, like pistols, rifles, any any type of weapon, I'm like, I hand it to them. Like, here's it unloaded. You know, here's what you need to do to first get it. You hand it to them, and you immediately say, "All right, don't put your finger on the trigger till you're ready to shoot." Yeah. The only time your finger goes on the trigger is you know where you're shooting, all that stuff. And the first thing they do is put the finger on the trigger because that's what it. It's built na- to naturally, do that. like in your mind, you're like, "Well, I mean, you hold a gun with your finger on the trigger." It takes some muscle memory to kind of, I mean, to get in the to, habit of keeping the finger out of the trigger guard. If you know you're right, if you're right-handed shooter and you're right-eye dominant, you yeah. know your, your right hand is your gun hand, yeah. your left hand is your work hand. So everything that needs to function with the gun should be done with the left hand, and the right hand stays right where it is. The yeah. gun always stays down range, but it's mentally tough to do that because you got two hands, so people yeah. always want to reach over and do the different stuff, Yeah, uh, and that's when accidents occur, bad awesome. things happen. Yeah. A little twirl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Little uh, go Doc straight, Holiday, type. go straight rifle man with your lever action. Oh, yeah. That's why in this range you do not get to twirl anything. <laughs> There's no straight. twirling. Yeah, correct. Exactly. Um, That's well, lame. <laughs> <laughs> what a boring range. Yeah, exactly. What do you mean I can't? I can't do a Johnny Ringo style impression. Well, it's Quick funny, draw. It's funny that you hit on that, right? Because I mean, in reality. It can be a boring range if that's if all you're allowed to do is stand in the stall and shoot your Which gun is what you're and supposed to do, right? no holstering, unholstering. So it's uh, it's a challenge for us, but a fun challenge for us to find new, unique ways to get shooters out there doing something fun. Yeah. And so we now certify people to draw from the holster. Yeah. So once you're certified and you have your holster card, basically, I mean, you can draw from the holster on the range. Uh, and then in very controlled environments, we do in front of the firing line shooting uh, every Wednesday. We have some form of IDPA um, kind of running gun style shooting. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's typically for a score in kind of a league format. format so yeah. uh, plenty of range safety officers. Sure. You know, uh, people are allowed to make mistakes, but that's why yeah. we're there is to make sure that those mistakes are kept to a minimum. And once we learn from them once, we're not repeating them. Because yeah. somebody who's doing the same thing over and over and over again they're just going to be asked to leave the range for that yeah. day. And then they'll be asked to come back. Um, and if they can prove that they won't make the same I'm mistakes again, stop being dumb. Keep doing it. <laughs> no. You know? Yes. Yeah. Water bottle is water. <laughs> no. Down Napoleon. I wish we could get everybody, everybody who has shot a gun before or likes to shoot a gun, I wish we could get them on speed steel just one time. It's most of the time people haven't done it. Like my wife's been shooting for. 10 years, Yeah, never shot speed steel before. Never even knew what it was. Never had the inkling that she wanted to do it. What it just for yeah, a person say, who doesn't know, what is so that? Speed steel, basically like a, a steel, uh, it's got five to seven different drop steel targets, little uh, circles that okay. sit on a metal bar inside the range. They're up. When you hit them, they fall down. Okay. And the idea is, is to shoot them as fast as you can under control yeah. with a specified number of rounds and yeah. not leave any of them standing. Oh, wow. And typically it's from the holster. So as you continue to do it, your time on target gets faster. Yeah. The, the repetition of how you squeeze the trigger and how you move target to target gets faster. And eventually it gets really fast. Yeah. Um, and when it gets really fast, I mean, it's well, fun, fun doing it slow. Yeah. Because uh, it's even fun when you ding, miss. Because <laughs> now you, your target has a purpose, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not a human target. Yeah. It's a, it's a purposeful, you know, fun target. Yeah, to shoot. exactly. Uh, and sport shooting can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Most people associate, hey, we're training to go shoot humans. Well, that's not really what no, we're training yeah. for. We're training to be more proficient and better with our firearm or other firearms. Well, I mean, for us, uh, you know, like uh, being hunters and stuff, I mean, de- in Texas, it, it doesn't occur that much. But I guess with a hog, it may occur where you have to, like, draw on something quick. But, I mean, if I'm in the back country and I've got – and I'm in – brown bear country or i'm anywhere where there's bears i i want to make sure that if i've got to pull that thing out and shoot it that i don't have you know it's not like okay it's not a paper target anymore it's a it's something trying to come at me so it may not be a human being but it could be a bear that's attacking it could be a mountain lion that's attacking and you want to make sure that you're ready to go for that kind of a situation totally so. and we mostly see it with young shooters yeah they'll come in and they can hit a dime yeah. at 100 yards in our indoor rifle range and they are, I mean, as good as anybody yeah. else shooting at the same target. You get them out on a deer, they will miss five times in a row. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. the, the heart rate's elevated. Mm-hmm. Once adrenaline starts going, everything's different. So yeah. the way they 
practice is the way they should be doing it when they're shooting Absolutely. a deer. And so the only way we can do that is make them do push-ups, make yep. them do some, you know, standing lunges, get their yep. heart rate elevated a little bit, and then tell them to get on. They got four seconds to put one in the bullseye. I'm a, I'm a big bow hunter, and that's what I do uh, to get ready every year. I, I will go run and run and run and run and come back, and I have, I'll just have my bow sitting there, pull it, draw back with, you know, breathing hard, heart rate up and everything, and it's, it, like I said, it changes. You know, you can't, you could try to replicate it. Um, I try to think about it like, okay, you've got this deer's just there for that second. You got to shoot now, kind of. And so I try to do that, and it's it's made me a lot better shot. Now, if I can get one in front of me on public land, <laughs> he's gonna go down. Yeah. But <laughs> well, it's actually a great lead into some of the stuff that we try to teach folks mm-hmm. who are shooting here, especially you know when it's 112 degrees outside, yeah, and it's 69 degrees in our range you get a cold bore shot a lot faster than if you're shooting outside. Yeah. And most guys want to practice with a cold bore, um, meaning, you know, they hadn't, the barrel is back to the normal temperature it would yeah. be when they go take their shot, which changes the ballistics, right? If you're shooting mm-hmm. a warm barrel, it's, it's different than the cold barrel. Uh, and so every time you zoom in on that scope and you're utilizing the magnification, every single movement, breath, heartbeat, yeah. adrenaline, I mean, you name it, even if you've got a twitch or something, I mean, yeah. All of it is magnified just that much more, how much more zoom you're using on your scope. So we'll typically let, especially the younger hunting generation, we'll have them zoom all the way out. Yeah. Because you're, you're still going to hit the deer at a hundred yards. You're just not counting the hair follicles on its kill, kill zone with it all the way zoomed in. Well, when you're all the way zoomed in, I mean, subconsciously you're not squeezing that trigger because you think, Oh, I'm not on target because the reticles moving. Mm -hmm. So if you zoom all the way out, you don't see the heartbeat. You don't see breathing hard. You don't see little movements you're making with your hand or with your body or the blind is making. Yeah. Um, Or the guy who's hunting next to you, if he's moving around (laughs) the blind, it's moving everything zoomed out. You don't see any of that. So you can actually make a more confident shot, Shot. uh, not utilizing all the zoom. Yeah. That's why guys are building hunting rifles and they're putting, you know, 24 and 30x scopes on there yeah hey man just want to want you to know what is going to happen if you use all 24 of those and you're not shooting at 2,000 yards exactly 24x at 100 yards it's it's a big old target with a lot of movement in the rifle i don't think you need to see that closely no (laughs) (laughs) Um, it's fun yeah no doubt i'm uh i'm enjoying it i've got a new um a new pistol uh 300 blackout that i've got a red dot on and it's really the first time i've shot with like a red dot like that repetitively most everything i've had is just like a traditional style hunting rifle you know where it's i've got that traditional scope on it so i really like that the fact that i don't get that zoom and that i i kind of get that like what you were talking about that kind of non-magnification where you kind of have to dial in a little bit better yeah and when we push red dots a lot here specifically Mm -hmm. and in texas because of hogs yeah uh whether you're walking or riding yep so with a red dot you know your field of view just expanded by 40 plus degrees 30 something plus degrees you close one eye to look through a magnified optic you just lot your peripheral vision just zoomed yeah. way down almost mm-hmm. like a slice of pizza you yeah. get to open that second eye so hogs are always on the move they're not just yeah. going to stand there and let you shoot them so when they're on the move that other eye is allowing you to lead and get on target a whole lot faster because you what's your average four seconds to yeah. get a shot off on a pig from when you see them to when you don't. Yeah. Uh, and with red dots, you'll have a lot more success yeah. doing that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what I built that gun for is just hog gun. Yeah. Uh, three and a blackout. Hit them like yeah. a Mack truck. Mm-hmm. It's great. I can't wait. I'm, I'm all about the Trumpo now. I figured out how to do the, the Trumpo El Pastor. So we're going to do that on some wild hog. That's have you uh, had awesome. Trumpo tacos? Trumpo? Like, I have not. Oh, uh, it's just, it's like pork that's marinated in like a pineapple. Um, you know, like pineapple-based marinade, and uh, with like paprika and garlic and cumin and all of some good stuff. You stack it up like a get a slice of uh, pineapple, and then stick a, a skewer through it, and then you just cut little uh, kind of like steaks, if you will, like little sh- shavings of a uh, of meat, and slide it slide it onto that, and then. St- Stacks like up. Like a shish kebab with Yeah, pineapple. shish kebab, but it's like, you know how you get like a hero and they carve that stuff off oh, at yeah. like a Greek? You do that in your oven, 350 for like, I think like 45, 30, 45 minutes or something like that and 
shave it off. Oh, man, so sounds good. awesome. Yeah, so good. I need to figure out if that's on the menu. We've got we're working on a cooking series uh, yeah. with some of the chefs that are around uh, DFW. Yeah, to come in and do a wild game cooking series. Oh wow, awesome! Um, and all of those guys have their own cookbooks or their own spice sure. combos or dry mm-hmm. rubs, mm-hmm. and so we'll let them push their product as yeah. much as they want because we've tried most of them they're all great yeah we haven't found a bad one yet but each one of those guys has a different way of doing wild game yeah um and all of them are great most yeah. of them serve some form of it in their restaurant yeah um and selfishly it's just really something i want to learn yeah uh, yep. and so if i can have them come here and we can have other people come sure. and do it too uh, that's just icing on the cake. Well, it's like it's like the whole purpose of this, right? You built this place for a, wh- where would I? What would I want if I was going to shop for this stuff? And here it is, right? <laughs> exactly right. That's exactly what we did. Yeah. Everybody that works here who's been here for a while yeah. has some form of them in the store. Yeah. It's it's I, it's a great store. I can't wait to go out and look at more of it for sure. <laughs> you know. Um, so as far as just kind of just some some tips. For, I guess we can start with rifles. Uh, you know, what can somebody do in the off season this time of the year? They're it's not deer season. How can they stay sharp and ready to go at the house? Right. Obviously, yeah. coming to a range is great, Mid- but middle of the week they don't really live yeah. close to a range, especially one that goes out to a hundred. Let's say they live Arlington, a little bit further away from this. What's something in the middle of the week after work, sit in the house that you can do safely to? Keep yourself sharp. Keep yourself sharp. Well, I'm sure Matt will probably have some stuff on this too, but I would sit, first start with it's how, how do they store their gun because what we sure. see a lot, right, guys will go hunt once, twice, maybe three times a year. Then they go back, they put their gun in their gun safe or under their bed or whatever, and they don't see it again for a year. Yeah. Uh, and if it's not stored properly, when it comes back out, it's not ready to go. So yeah. keeping our equipment in uh, workable form, um, oh, what do they call it when guys – sports off season they keep themselves in uh, game shape or yeah, whatever game you shape, yeah. keep the the rifle in game shape um and there are several ways to do that mostly with the right cleaning products or the right dehumidification tools okay um but what i typically do is just what we were talking about earlier i want to get my heart rate up get my heart rate elevated i want to verify that my gun's unloaded obviously sure um and i can do that by taking the bolt out yeah right and so once my heart rate's up i want to set a target out there and I want to get on it, and I want to squeeze the trigger off with some confidence that I just put the yeah. bullet where I have the crosshairs aimed. Yeah. Um, and just that repetition, just doing that even a couple times during the off season, yeah, keeps you just mentally sharp on what you're going to be <coughs> seeing and what you're going to be doing when the time comes to go hunt. And a lot of guys around here, especially, they're going to Colorado every so often to hunt yeah. a different either mule deer or elk, um, or they're going on some kind of destination hunt. Yeah. It's kind of a universal self-help right yeah. i mean it doesn't matter what you're hunting and where you're hunting it being able to control your reticle under yeah. duress is the name of the game mm. exactly so if you, if you set a target up uh to get on does it matter how far it is away from you like i've never worried about distance just because i mean i can actually tell if i'm controlling my reticle better just a spot. if i'm at 20 yards on my fence than i can if i'm got a little bitty target out there at 100 or 200 mm-hmm. yards. Yeah. I mean, obviously, all of this is secondary to actually getting out to the range and putting real rounds yeah. down range and seeing where you hit and how your rifle's performing because it doesn't always happen, but it certainly does happen where you've got a, a really high-end rifle, and we'll leave manufacturer names out of it. Sure. Um, the gun just doesn't group. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many grain weights you try. It doesn't matter how you clean it. It doesn't matter who else works on it. Retapping yeah. the the top of the receiver for a new, you know, a new scope tap. Yeah. Uh, for a mount, changing your rings, changing the scope. None of it's going to work. Yeah. The gun just doesn't group. Yeah. And so the only way to actually know that is by getting out and, and getting yeah. some real work behind it. Figuring out how it's how that gun itself is performing and what you need to do to compensate for that. Yeah. I would say one out of 50 rifles, and that may be a conservative sure. ratio, but one out of 50 rifles just doesn't group. And we're talking 3000 to $6,000 yeah. rifles that yeah. just do not function the way they're manufactured to function. Is it just because, I mean, what, is it a, something in particular? I mean, obviously taking the human out of it. I mean. I wouldn't be the one no. to tell you. Yeah. Honestly. Um, I, just I've heard all happen, sorts yeah. of different reasons. We yeah. use a we use a guy named Lloyd Hill, who's an Ennis, uh, who does all of our load data. Uh, most of the scopes nowadays come with some form of of 
load data conversion for your turret. Okay. Um, which, you know, some Green Beret friends of ours, that's the easy button. They wish they had the easy button. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not in war. Yeah. And so I want anything that can help me have success on a hunt. Yeah. Um, and so having a turret that is marked in yardage yeah. instead of an MOA or, or uh, mill radian. Yeah. I am taking it. Yeah, right on. My new scope <laughs> has yardage on it. And yeah. now most of the loop holds, Vortex, mm -hmm. Night Force, I mean, you can have this turret made. Well, for the turret to be made correctly, you got to have good load data. Yeah. And so I don't do that. Yeah. Um, we outsource it. Um, okay. So anybody bringing a gun to our gunsmith that wants load data, we take it out there. And Lloyd will spend the day with it, taking it from 100 to the max effective range, their range goes out to a mile. Oh my so God. So if you've got a 26 nozzle or a 28 nozzle, yeah. he, he'll, he'll walk it out to a mile if you want him to. Uh, but for like the guys, those of us that run like a 6.5 Creedmoor, yeah. from 100 to 750 yards, 800 yards, that load data is real, real yeah. ballistics, real ballistic coefficient, real muzzle velocities, nothing off the box. Yeah. Um, and now that turret is married. I mean, it is built for my gun, for yeah. my round, has it etched on the top. So... Even if I let somebody use my rifle, they can now shoot out to 800 yeah. yards with some confidence. Wow. What about uh, you, Will? Anything, ideas or other other types of things besides that to stay sharp during the off season? There are several different types of training tools that exist. Matt, I said Will. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No worries. No worries. Strike one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there I didn't say one of the wrong names like Scott. I didn't be like Scott. Steve. Steve. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Samsonite. Samson. <laughs> Um, there are all kinds of electronic training devices that'll that are will use a combination of visible and IR okay. um, systems. That, of course, again, we'll leave manufacturers out of it. But there are different ones you can use that will trace everything at your muzzle. Okay. The how much you moved on the barrel, why you were on the target, once going from on the target to when the trigger was actually pressed. It'll show you movement there, so you can actually see some of that stuff down. Obviously, without there are both sure. live fire and dry fire configurations you can get in these okay. these different programs, and um, those certainly help. They have them for both rifle and long range stuff, and they also have them for um, uh, handguns as well. Okay, you you can get the almost like a chamber bore sight. Okay, but every time you strike these particular ones, they'll shoot a laser downrange, which will interact with the target. You can go set the target, you know whatever distance you want to be at, just work on trigger control alone. Sure. Um, so those systems are always great. Now, which one you like or prefer always depends on your budget and everything yeah. else. That'll be go. But the um, uh, one thing recently that I've just circled back around to, because anytime I buy a rifle, I buy a scope, I want to get it mounted, shoot it as quickly as possible. Yeah. Uh, one thing I forget sometimes, especially with some of the newer optics and the new reticles that are out there, is the capabilities that you've got. Um, several different companies have of course you have you know moa and then you have the mrad systems um just knowing the how to use the mrad system for just range finding application yeah um we recently went out on a hunt and fortunately we had some nice thermal range finding binoculars yeah. that helped us uh, but just knowing that of course it's daylight if i'm between here and here on the reticle and they have their own little everyone's got their different yeah. conversions that you just know yeah. on the fly because i you know Target turrets are great. The adjustments, the dope's great. But there's no, I mean, Kentucky windage. You know, if you've got that yep. down with your rifle, yeah. yep, you're yep. solid in whatever scenario you're at. And but again, just knowing your reticle. Yeah. I opened up. I crapped a man, crapped, cracked a manual open the other day, and um, was looking at some of the conversions on it, and then just how didn't realize the capabilities that I had because, like you were saying earlier, I don't use full magnification. I'm yeah. gonna run the lowest power. I'm right-handed, but I'm left eye dominant. So when, right. I'm, <laughs> when I'm on an optic, it doesn't matter what it is. If I can run to both eyes open, I'm going to because my right eye will just get tired yeah. faster. It's I've done yeah. everything I could to fix it. I've yeah. taped over shooting glasses and just ran it. Just yeah, uh, my right eye is just there's no substitute. Yeah. Um, but the just knowing your reticle, knowing how to gauge um, some windage as well as elevation and just distance on you know the difference between the you know, knowing your basic game, yeah. silhouette size of a deer and a, and a pig and stuff like that just will go, you know, way. a long way in the field when you don't have access to some of the higher tech stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's just circling back around to your equipment that you do have, be sure it's maintained, but also know in and out how they function, how they work. I can tell you how many guys I've heard the stories that they didn't even know how their 
safety. They didn't realize they had a three position safety and that it could you could run your bolt, but the uh, <laughs> safe was still in that position and lost a good animal because they didn't you know switch it one other position. Yeah. Um, and it's it's knowing your equipment, using some of the high tech stuff, keeping it maintained, all of yeah. the above. Really, in the off season will, will certainly help you out. But the biggest thing is when you don't have time to do. Again, I'm impatient when I get new stuff and I yeah. want to play with it. Oh yeah. Uh, once you've had it, you've used it. Sitting back, reading some of the literature that actually comes with it. I don't think any guy really likes to break out the instructions first yeah. thing. But um, when you start digging into some of that stuff, it'll really. I mean, again, oh, found, I found a lot of cool features. How to use the shim set that it comes with on one of my. One of the Vortex optics, you yeah. know. I'm like, I'm, I've never used that before. I'm never going to use that. But actually, now that I've read about it, I'm like, okay. That okay. makes a lot of sense. I've got a couple IKEA tables that prove. I right. Like to okay. I like yeah. your manuals. I have I all of lesson. these extra parts. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. A good, uh, a, a good yeah, mechanic supposed to go on there. <laughs> always yeah. has extra parts. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> That's what I tell everybody. Those are just throwaways. Yeah. These are extras. Yeah, I can, I can tell you how many times, like, I've, I've, I slap a scope on my rifle and I run it forever just like that. And I'm. Bust, did the same thing, bust out the manual, and I was like, oh, wow, this no, thing's this is, fancy. This is, this is all wrong. <laughs> this is all wrong. This is all wrong. I need to change all of this. Well, it bit me the other day because I sat it in a rifle, and I didn't reset my turrets to zero Yeah. just because I was in a hurry. Sure. Put my rifle in a bag, pulling my hand out of the bag, bracelet catches on the turret and just zips it around half a turn. So now I'm just, that was my own fault. But. Yeah. If I wouldn't have, you know, if I'd have reset it to zero, took the time right then, I'd be okay because I could just click it right back. But yeah. I missed a mule deer last year because of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, somebody else had shot the rifle the day before me. I never checked the turret to make sure it was back to zero, so it was doped to a thousand. Oh, okay. Uh, and I was shooting a mule deer at 500 yards. Yeah. And luckily, he was up on top of the hill. I was skylining him, but oh, now yeah. with the suppressor and that the deer never moved and about the fourth shot in i realized so holy hell I the elevation on that turret's <laughs> real high i went to turn it and sure enough it cranked a full revolution back to zero and then i went back to 420 yeah and smoked him took care of the d- wow i was lucky he didn't run off <laughs> yeah but I mean, like, oh man I, man i thought i was bad <laughs> <laughs> this is not going well that's when you start looking at I shoot guy. all the time and hunt every year and have for, I don't know, two decades. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm supposed to be beyond those mistakes, but it's just one of those humbling reminders that, mm-hmm. you know, I start skipping steps yeah. and not checking my equipment and doing what I know I should do. Yeah. And it almost bit me in the butt. I mean, I think that, like you said, it just goes to prove it doesn't matter who you are, or how long you've been doing it. If you try to rush something, you're going to make a mistake. 100%. You know? it's, it, it may be something that doesn't cost you anything. It may not be, it may be a, uh, an error that is no consequences, but it, you know, you, maybe it's that, maybe it's one that you don't get it, right? Maybe it's... It actually you, taught me a new one yeah. to put my equipment back the way it's supposed to be yeah. when I go to store it. No matter if I'm thinking about I'm going to use it again in an hour yeah. or I'm going to use it again in a week, putting it back, everything back to zero, everything set up the way it was set up or meant to be set up yeah. before I store it, which typically, right, we're tired at the end of a hunt or we're yeah. tired at the end of the night shooting pigs. I don't want to go through all that right then. Yeah. I want to go inside and go to sleep and then get up the mm-hmm. next day and do all that. Exactly. Well, hell, we might go hunt the next morning. Exactly. And everything's already messed up. Yeah. It's already, you're already starting from behind. So. Yeah. So kind of getting in, that kind of leads me into one thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, obviously you guys probably don't listen to our podcast, <laughs> but no if comment. you did, you would, uh, you would probably find it pretty funny because there's two guys on this podcast that barely ever clean their rifles. Like, Never at my my I'm one of them. My shotgun has probably not been cleaned in two years, and uh, it runs like a dream. But for normal people and people that want to do things right, what is your regiment of like? So you just got back from a hunt. It's the middle of the season. Do you go ahead and just run a boar snake down down it? You know what all is a good way of like? Can you overclean? Is there stuff that's not necessary? Well, I think all the above. But if we're starting with so shotguns being the first thing, now there's a product that, I mean, it's called Clean Shot. It's, yeah, it's, a, all that. it's awesome, and it works. Uh, we demoed it at SHOT Show with the uh, owner of the company. Um, he had a shotgun out there that had, I don't know, a couple hundred rounds through it. 
looked pretty dirty. Yeah. He runs one round through it, and that thing was spotless. Wow. Um, and once we saw it work, it, it's in all of our stores now. Yeah. Um, and that's just one shot. And if you got a shot uh, over under, you just run two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Top barrel, bottom barrel, store it. It's good. It's got the cleaning solution on it. It's got the some kind of nitrogen mix and some some oversized so like shot. A, it's like a, sh- a shell that you put in and shoot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it had, does the cleaning solution and the boar snake all in one shot. And you don't have hmm. to do anything else, and you just put it up and go. And everything that came out of the end of the boar is biodegradable. So you're not messing up yeah, the environment yeah, just, and, and littering. Yeah. You just take the hole, throw it in the trash can, and put your shotgun up, and it's good to go. Man, my neighbors are going to be pissed at me. I think they're going to be <laughs> pissed at you for shooting guns more than just the, uh, you know, the, the, the actual cleaning stuff coming out. But on rifles... Yeah, uh, I, I fall into the same category. I mean, I, I think you can absolutely overclean a rifle. Um, you can use materials that are caustic that are not good for your gun. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you use them a lot, then, I mean, ultimately you've just lowered the effective life of your barrel, most likely, or the rifling within it. Um, that's why I would say, I mean, barrel break-in is, is more important than the continual cleaning of your gun. Somebody's going to listen to this and have a comment sure. that I'm we don't, wrong. But we don't care about them. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, I mean, I haven't cleaned my rifle in, I don't know, two years. Yeah, I like mean, I'll wipe the bolt down. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I'll check the firing pin every once in a while just to make sure there's not carbon buildup back there. But because my barrel was broken in the right way, I mean, I can put a boar snake down it and look like a little camera and I can mm-hmm. see if all the rifling's clogged up or not. And it's not. So no need for me to mess with it again. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not putting massive amounts of rounds through my bolt gun either. So guys that are shooting PRS and some of that other stuff, they're cleaning the rifle often. And if I were doing that, I'd be cleaning it after every time I went to compete. Yeah. But because I'm only putting probably 30 rounds through it a year, um, there's just not a need for me to do it. I would say at, a, at 100 rounds, I'm going to clean it for sure. So as you were talking about barrel break-in, so I've got a new 300 blackout. I've sighted in everything. What would be a good regiment to break that barrel in? What would you suggest? So w- one, I would say on a 300 blackout, you're not pushing the velocities that would require sure. a barrel break-in. Okay. You can certainly break it in if you want to, but yeah. I don't think you're going to see a huge difference in performance whether okay. if you don't. Um, I would tell you GA Precision, and I believe Christensen has a new one out. They've got some barrel break-in kind of um, Falcor Defense, I think, has one as well for their uh, 6.5 and 300 Win Mag semi-auto platforms. Uh, but I've always followed GA Precision's break-in. Okay. I, I might minimize it a little bit because, I mean, yeah. if you're doing it outdoors waiting for cold bore every time, uh, it's gonna be a you're, you're going to spend three to four hours at the range yeah. just waiting for cold bore to pour carbor, uh, carbon and copper fouling cleaner and scrubbing it, and then you're pushing patches until it's clean again. Yeah. But essentially, the, the Cliff Notes version of barrel break-in, is, the intent is to heat it, to expand it, cool it to bring it to minimize it and bring it back down to normal and what you're trying to do is get all the stuff that's going to stay in there for the life of the gun okay. out while it's hot okay so when it cools it's not compressing that down into the rifling of your barrel right so once you have if anybody's dealt with carbon before sure. carbon is the antichrist mm-hmm. right yeah. whether you're running suppressors you're messing with guns hell your car right yeah. carbon is very hard to clean once it is cooled okay. so to get it out of there while it's hot is a, a good idea um, and so if that's not pressed down in your rifling, then your, your bullet's going to have better spin on it. You're going to have a more repeatable shot. The bullet's going to be more stable at the exit. And again, somebody listening is going to be smarter than this, than me, uh, and probably have some comments on it. But from what I know and what I've experienced, uh, you can minimize that barrel break-in procedure, but just by doing a little bit is better than none. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially on a high power, high velocity rifle. That's a precision rifle. Okay. Um, because it's that you want it to be repeatable. And once you've got rifling that's caked full of copper and carbon and the combination of the two, and it's not cleaned, and now it's set in there and basically permanent, Yeah. you're never getting it out, and there went your rifling. There went the spin on your bullet. There went, I mean, a lot of the stabilization that happens in the 22 or 24 inches of barrel you got, uh, and it's gone. Yeah. I think with ARs, it's certainly different. Most yeah. people don't even question break in on ar platform barrels not that you yeah. shouldn't yeah um but a lot of the even some of the local companies that manufacture different ar platform rifles whether it's 556 five, 300 blackout doesn't matter um the quick and dirty is go run whatever full metal jacket ammo you've got through it um and then clean it pretty well and then and like a like i said box of 20 yeah. Enough to heat it up to the point where the running the snakes or the rods, whatever you've got, sure. um, just will ensure 
that you get it out. But that's another part of that too is uh, using the one piece rods helps that quite a bit. Yeah. Um, because a lot of the convenient piece together rods that a lot of people like to use, they don't realize how much they're flexing and how much they're moving inside that barrel. Yeah. Um, and if you've ever used one till it broke, which you have, I have in the <laughs> past. I've learned my lesson since then, trying to get that out. But it's um pretty pretty easy because yeah. the 300 blackout too no one's going to claim that's going to be a precision round sure but what most people don't realize is if you do want some some performance out of it you can run some of the lighter supersonic loads and do extremely well and, and get the full potential of that yeah. round um i mean i'll be the first to attest that yeah the subsonic stuff sounds good that i run suppressed but yeah. it doesn't hold a penny to the supersonic yes, like exactly. 110 insert manufacturer because um, yeah. it's still 110 grains lead moving at 2300 roughly feet per second so you're going to get the performance and that's what last pick on we went on we used that yeah um and it i mean just dirt nap as soon as it hit them yeah Let's, assuming you get a somewhat decent yeah, shot um but the um the break-in on ar platform again most people don't even broach the subject because it, it's the traditional hunters that'll ask that question yeah it's the newer style shooters that immediately get into AR platforms and don't even normally yeah. ask or know no, what a barrel break is. Even yeah, they don't the they don't include yeah. it in the literature because yeah. <coughs> I don't think it's going to with the types of ammo issue yeah. a lot of production ammunition you're going to run through that uh, and combined with a shooter and the optics you're not going to get any type of match accuracy out of it anyway unless yeah. they're actually putting better ammo, putting it in a vi or a, a bench, you yeah. know, and actually trying to get there. Um but it's Heat it up, clean it, and then find the stuff you want to focus. And you might try some of the top-notch ammo. Yeah. And it might not like it. I mean, yeah. You, it's that's the unfortunate thing is you could run the spend the most money you want, but if that particular barrel doesn't make with that particular ammo, yeah. it doesn't matter what you do. I'm yeah, lucky. Exactly. Mine mine married up with 55 grain FMJ Winchester. Yeah. <laughs> I can't get out much cheaper than that. Yeah. I'm really glad it didn't cling onto the barns or the Hornady you yeah know, performance stuff because I may not shoot it as much as I do. Yeah, exactly. But I for mean, those people who are going to break in their barrel, I mean, we, I, I think we're pretty strong advocates of the nylon brushes. Yeah. Um, cause I don't want to, I don't want to put metal down my metal barrel. Typically. Um, there are plenty of people that will tell you it not going to matter at all. Yeah. And so maybe it's a, it's just a subconscious mental thing. For sure. Me. Uh, so we'll push the nylon brushes quite a bit. Um, and then it's funny. There are a lot of products out there that claim to be all in one, carbon copper fouling cleaner lubricant rust inhibitor etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, and i've been told by people much smarter than me that at the molecular level it is impossible yeah. for something to be all of those things yeah right so be careful what you buy sure uh, we don't push any one product we stock several different manufacturers yeah. but we've gone through some of the q a with the manufacturers just to verify what they are pushing and what they're putting on their product is true and accurate and i would just be careful you don't have to run super caustic chemical smelling type stuff yeah um, that you know is going to combust in your trash can and start a fire later <laughs> yeah um to get your gun clean you can use a lot um less invasive products to achieve the same results or results if mm -hmm. not better maybe and that's yeah. assuming you maintain it sooner rather than later yeah if you wait till it's disgusting like Unfortunately, we get some of our range guns because we run them hard. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of them you can quite literally scrape the black goo out of the receivers of some of these guns. Yeah. We've got um, some of them at 60, 70, 80,000 round counts. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because every, every Friday we're running full autos all throughout the day, and those things are just getting hammered and hammered and hammered. It's, um, and it's 9 millimeter too, so it's not even a, a rifle round. Yeah. It's but the amount of fouling and stuff that we get on those, we're replacing parts all the time. We're having yeah. to do all that, so it's... Um, the catching it early, maintaining it more often. The nylon brushes are great. Yeah. Um, but some people that'll use the steel and the brass. I mean, hopefully they don't use a lot of steel, but the brass. Uh, yeah. You just got a little get a little more aggressive if yeah. you if you've waited too long. So. And we get the question quite often about ultrasonic cleaning. Because yeah. Because that's become a pretty popular topic in the last couple of years, uh, and hell, probably was way popular before that. Yeah, but, but we've gotten a lot of questions the last two years because now there are mobile ultrasonic deals. You go out homemade, to these state yeah, shoots. Exactly. People bring a trailer that has a bunch of ultrasonic stuff. Yeah. Um, and we're advocates of ultrasonic, but only one to two times a year. Yeah. Uh, there are some guys that are, you know, bringing their guns to us when they come off the range, like, hey, I want to get this ultrasonic cleaned. Sir, we saw you did that 
the last three weeks, yeah. you know, let's not do that again because those are more invasive products. Sure. Um, and obviously you're running electric current through uh, yeah. some form of fluid uh, yeah. that's agitating and getting damp. Metal's really cool and that it's a lot like your skin, right? It's yeah. porous. Yeah. You heat it up, the pores open, you cool yeah. it down, the pores close. So the gun actually will sweat oil if you've heated it and soaked it in oil and let it cool because it's absorbing yeah and, clo- and it's picking up things that you don't see with your naked eye yeah uh, and so i'm a big proponent of the ultrasonic every part on your gun going in the ultrasonic but only one to two times yeah, a year yeah you don't because that's a deep time. that's a deep clean yeah right? that talking about oils and stuff like that I, i've had many a people like older guys i'll be running my pistol and stuff out of deer lease or whatever and they'll be like man you know like uh you really need to oil this thing and they'll just like want to want me to run it like wet is all get out like, they're like man you need to like when you put it up it should be leaking oil out of it and mm. i'm like Mm-mm. see i don't know who taught them that that's a, but like it's it, funny but i hear it somebody who sells somebody who sells gun oil yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. you gotta use more of this stuff bank. man yeah uh no we we are definitely a, a much stronger advocate of the minimal yeah minimal is better uh, I mean, when I'm cleaning my guns now, my pistol specifically, I think I use four drops of oil total for yeah. the whole gun. Uh, I mean, I want to see just enough to see a little shimmer like I, I did put it on there. Yeah. But not enough that if I wiped my finger, it would come off yeah, on my Yeah, you're finger. not like greasy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, think about what that oil is doing, right? Yeah. I mean, Every time you shoot around, there's a bunch of extra stuff that's coming out of that casing. Yeah. And all of that carbon and if there is copper coming off the jacket all of yeah. that extra stuff is just accumulating in the oil and depositing itself wherever you have oil accumulated yeah. and so it's basically just creating hot spots for your gun for a future failure yeah it's so, well, i was gonna say so for like a bolt gun kind of bringing this back into like a hunting perspective like do you have like some key components that you normally will put a few drops on like your bolt uh you know bolts about it I mean, well, that's that's, I mean, that's all I put it, maybe a little bit right uh, inside the chamber where the bolt would touch. I mean, typically mm-hmm. I'm looking for any spot on my gun where metal is touching metal. And where metal touches metal, you're going to see it. Yeah. Because right? there's a wear mark. I mean, hell, even on polymer pistols, I mean, there's a wear mark where metal is touching. Right. That is where I want the oil. Um, and I'm, but on bolt guns, I, I'm even more of a minimalist uh, with the oil. Um, only because until there's a problem, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. right. So unless you're having a sticking issue or your bolt isn't as free flowing as it was when you first bought the rifle, I don't think oil is going to fix whatever it is you're looking to fix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> More lube. More oil. There's stuff to be said about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so any, do you have anything else on, on rifles? I think I'd love to move to shotguns. If you want to move shotguns, go right ahead. You pull this wherever you want, Bumble. So, uh, what about some stuff on shotguns? Just trying to, you know, kind of using the same format of questions we did with the rifle. What about a shotgun staying sharp at home? Right. Ob- the the obvious of go shoot as much as you can. But what do, what are some things you could do at the house that would kind of be some some ways to stay sharp or? So what I, I typically do, and I typically only do it when dove season's rolling around or I know we're going on a quail hunt. And mm-hmm. obviously in years past, right, going on a quail hunt didn't mean you were going to see any quail. Yeah. Now I think, you know, the population's coming back pretty strong. So now I've got a, a reasonable amount of faith that we're going to see some quail this year when we go on our hunt. Um, what I'll do, a couple things that a guy taught me one time that really helped me um, was just getting in position where I'm in the same spot on the comb, same spot on the vent rib every time I shoulder the shotgun because when you're going quail or dove hunting, they come out of nowhere. Yeah. They're coming up fast, and they're gone just as fast. So can I get up into the same position every time quickly and then thus make a, an accurate shot? Um, and so it was actually the, the head gunsmith from Caesar Greeny came down, and he told us this thing. He said, say yes to the stock and then smell it. So if you think about what that means, is if I shoulder the shotgun and I say yes to it, meaning my head goes up and down, all the meat on my cheek gets onto the comb. So if I do that every time, yeah. right, my head is in the same position. Typically, right, everybody wants to talk about length of pull and all these the customizations. Unless you are super huge yeah. or super small, yeah. there, the length of pull is, is meant to be what the length of pull yeah. is, right? It's going to fit you. Um, and obviously take that as a great with a great sure. salt right but the majority of people fit a shotgun off the shelf yeah 
how they hold it and how they stand with it is ultimately determining their, in their mind whether or not it fits them. And so mm-hmm. with little corrections, we can typically get somebody feeling like, oh, oh this, this, is better. this comb yeah. does work for me, and I can see the sight, and, you know, the shotgun fits. So, so if you real say fast, you, you keep on using the word comb, you know, and I don't think that's a normally thrown around word for people coming Sorry, in this. The, so just the stock, the right. top of the stock, the part that touches your face. Okay. Um, and so because in a lot of the competition, there's an adjustable comb, which obviously allows people to customize that shotgun for them. Yeah. And they've got a lot more time to set up on it mm-hmm. in a competition setting. We're bird hunting, right? There's yeah, nothing, there is. There's nothing yeah. typical yeah. or standard or repeatable yeah. about bird hunting. They're just coming when they're coming, and yeah. they're going to go when they go. Um, and so if you, if you shoulder the shotgun and you say yes to it, you get the meat of your face up on top of the stock, which is what you want to do every time because if you don't, right, your cheek or your, your eye level is different every time you address the shotgun. And then the second thing he said was smell it. So most people tend to have this tendency to tilt their head over your spine should stay in perfect alignment, right? I mean, that's a strong position. That's when you are manipulating the gun and the gun doesn't manipulate you because you're in a strong position. Everything is lined up yeah. and your, your shoulders are square and you're in a good spot. You get this big offset and your head tilted over to the side. All of a sudden you're in a pretty weak position. You're using muscles you don't normally use trying to control the, yeah. the shotgun, which you just, you don't want to be doing that. Some people may get away with it and they shoot hell of a lot better than me. Yeah. Um, but for me, it worked out best to keep everything linear. Um, and once you smell the stock, instead of tilting my head over to the right, which would then adjust my eye line down, yeah. I'm smelling the stock, meaning I'm turning my head into it. Okay. So if my nose is almost touching the stock and I've already gotten the majority of my face on top of it, now I'm at the same position every time, typically on top of the vent rib or the barrel, looking down at the sight, and my eyes at the same spot every time, because typically when you're shooting, the, uh, someone who's good at it will tell yeah. you, don't look at the sight, look yeah. at the target. So you want to be in a position to be able to look down the barrel, see the sight, not focus on yeah, it, and then see your target. And so the only way I'm doing that with most of the shotguns out these days, especially over-unders, is I'm saying yes to it, and then I'm smelling it. Yeah, I think that's an awesome, I th- because I think that's my biggest problem, is just the repeating, putting myself back in the same spot every single time. And, and I didn't even think about, you know, twisting your head. Cause I guarantee you I'm doing that. It's, that's a, like you said, say yes to it and then smell it on the it outside. Really applies to saying, rifles that, too saying that two me. minutes ago, I was like, what in the hell? What in the hell is say yes and then smell it. But well, now can, it makes a lot of sense. I can say it in the store and yeah. until I do it, yeah, they don't know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, no. And I didn't know what he was talking about until he showed yeah. me. And then once I did it the first time, I mean, it, it changed the way I yeah. shot a shotgun. Absolutely. Uh, and I see a lot of people with this big offset in the shoulders. And I, I know everybody listening knows what we're talking about. Sure. Big offset in the feet. You know, everything yeah. turned off to the right or to the left, depending on if you're right or left-handed shooter. And when you get in that position, that if you think about it, if you're a linebacker about to take a hit, are you standing sideways? Mm-mm. He's going to knock you eight yards back yeah. and onto your butt. If you're standing square or more square when your shoulders are square, yeah. that's a strong position, right? There are muscles in your body that can be engaged that are strong muscles yeah. that keep you in the position you want to stay in. Well, shooting is the same way. I mean, you watch any of these, I don't want to say movies because Hollywood gets it wrong a lot. Uh, Except mil- for John Wick. Military documentaries. Yeah, right. <laughs> John Wick. You ever see John Wick standing sideways? No. You see coming in the room squared up yeah. in a strong position yeah. where he, there's not this offset. And yeah. I see offset especially with a lot of older shooters yeah they're putting themselves in a weak position to yeah. let the gun manipulate them how do you yeah. make a second good shot when the first shot puts you off kilter yeah uh it, it's hard to recover yeah. and get a second shot you square up even a little more squared up that's a strong position first shot goes you're still on target you're still on the comb you're yeah. still on the gun the way you want to be on the gun and you can make the second shot because it's as yeah. fast as you can pull the trigger with most of these shotguns, gas or inertia, yeah. they, it, as fast as you can pull the triggers, as fast as it's going to shoot. And so I want to be in a good position for the second shot. Yeah. Uh, and the way I can help myself do that is, one, practicing in the living room. Obviously, verify everything's unloaded. Sure. Um, but just practicing being in that position and getting up. And I would also say, I mean, I practice now with the shirt that I'm typically going to wear. Okay. Because it's hot in Texas when we yeah. hunt. And so I'm typically wearing a micro, you know, yeah. micro performance style shirt, a microfiber shirt, we call it yeah. Game Guard or sure. Magellan or Columbia, whatever, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and the shirt can hang up on your stock. So yeah. when you're trying to get up fast, 
it's hard to yeah, sometimes can, it's really hard to get in the position you want to be in because you can't get there without ripping your shirt. Yeah, you're just kind of like got to readjust. You got to look yeah. good when you're in the field Absolutely, too. Absolutely, you know? got to look good. Um, I just I think it's just you know it's just one of those things to me is like I think for as a bow hunter, obviously being repeatable and and bringing yourself back to the same anchor point is you've got to do it. I mean, I just to why I didn't put that together with a shotgun is just kind of you know probably the reason I miss so many birds. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> you know? I'm a bow hunter as yeah. well, which is a lot of people don't think that because we own a gun yeah, store and exactly. we predominantly do ARs and, yeah. and pistols and we sell shotguns, but you can't shoot shotguns here. You got to sure. go to our clay sports range. Uh, that, that repeatability in the bow and the practice you put in the boat, that yeah. exact same practice, yeah. the same anchor point, exact same with a rifle, a pistol yeah. and a shotgun. Exactly. I mean, just repeatable, right? You, you're, you're getting yourself in the same position over and over again. And like you said, even from a, even if you can get yourself in a position for, um, you know, the way you're holding the gun, if you're not holding, if you're off to the side again and you're moving back, well, it's pretty hard. Even if you do feel comfortable sitting off kilter, I'm sure it's hard to get back to that same position again to, to have that second shot or that third shot. Notice next gun. time you're in a gun range, how many yeah. people – their shoulders are behind their body center of gravity, meaning yeah. behind their waist versus the folks who have their shoulders kind of in front of their waist or over their yeah. waist. You will watch the folks who are lean back the second shot and not that everybody in the gun range is trying to shoot sure. fast. You'll just notice the average time between shots is significantly longer than the guy who's forward yeah. or the gal who's forward yeah. and has their weight on their toes. You know, a lot of people say if you imagine your feet are like Eagle talons. Yeah dig your talons into the ground yeah right so if you try to do that there's no way you can do that with your shoulders behind your waist yeah the only way to get your talons into the ground is to have your shoulders your weight forward, forward. not falling over yourself sure but if you're just putting yourself in the right position yeah uh, it it opens the door to be good or have a much better result yeah. shooting anything uh especially in our range i mean sure. if you're not in a good position you can still make some good shots, but you're not yeah. going to make them the way the guy is that's in the same position, good position, strong position every exactly. time. Well, I mean, it's just the range, out bird hunting or whatever, I mean, it's you're not doing – typically you're not doing it one time, right? It's, right. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's multiple times. So, yeah, you can get lucky one out of ten times or you can do it one out of ten times, but that's – you're not going to – go home with anything really of any consequence right it's, it's doing it nine out of ten times or ten out of ten times that really is that's how you get a limit <laughs> so when you're, when you're practicing in your living room yeah pick a light switch or something small yeah and come up to it slow the first time when you bring the shotgun up to your shoulder and you get aim on it you basically want to see right over that sight and see that light switch mm -hmm. then put the gun down turn yourself around move left to right or whatever and then see how fast you can get back on it yeah and that's that's that practice of getting in the same position every time and can you dig your talons into the ground yeah that's a i mean I, like you said body position is i mean it's got to be 90 percent 90 it's key to know? every yeah, sport out yeah. there why wouldn't it apply to ours yeah you exactly know? you know it's just, you think about it it's just like oh i've got to make sure i squeeze the trigger yeah that's yeah you, you got to do that but if you're not in the right position it doesn't matter how <laughs> slowly you squeeze the trigger you right. may not do very well repeatably and we're typically teaching it here so that folks enjoy shooting more sure because if you're in a weak position the gun is really i mean people fear recoil yeah. because recoil is a real thing and it's yeah. supposed to surprise you but it shouldn't be unmanageable yeah and it typically it's unmanageable because you put yourself in a in a bad position with you're your bad. body or a weak position with your body if you're in a strong position you are managing the recoil you're telling the gun what to do the gun's not telling you what to do what is uh you know why why do you kind of why is that is it is that kind of just a natural feel that people have a tendency to get in that position? or I wish I know? knew, yeah, honestly. I just, but, I mean, I would say that five out of six new shooters or folks who are or novice shooters, that, that's their tendency. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like a shying away from because okay. they, know, they know it's coming. Yeah. Uh, and so this, the weight is back. Or maybe that's just because of their head position. That's how they yeah. see the sight. So yeah. that's one of the first things we work on when somebody comes here. And it's, you don't have to be a part of a training class or get private instruction to get that tip. I yeah. mean, our RSOs are walking around. They're not going to give you any tips unless you ask for them. Sure. being in a bad position doesn't make you unsafe. Yeah, and I know. We're not here to correct everybody's shooting yeah. style. Uh, but for the folks who are wanting to learn or are get, just getting into it and they want to start on the right foot, that's what we're trying to do is get them in the right position first. So exactly. really the, the lesson starts in our laser simulator our okay. virtual simulator it doesn't start on the range because yeah. we can get you in the right position get the right sight picture right grip right stance 
in the computer-based simulation yeah. before we ever go to live fire. Hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting. That's, like I said, it's just something to think about, you know. Um, what about as far as shotgun goes from, you know, just a, a gadget type perspective, if you're, if you're one of those gear guys, what, what is something that you could put on your shotgun to, to improve your, you know, accuracy or, um, you know, talking about like what, maybe waterfowl hunting or, or yeah. upland game bird hunting Let me, uh, in particular. First go on record to say I'm not a shotgun expert. Yeah. In fact, I'm probably pretty bad at it. Um, but from what I've learned from the guys who are good at it. Sure. And you've seen it a lot now, even from the production models of shotguns the fiber optic site, the yeah. fiber optic bead. And uh, supposedly the, the human eye picks up green a lot better than it references red. Okay. And so you'll see like, you know, a, a green red dot site is a more expensive site than the red, red okay. dot site. Hmm. Um, and I, I think it's cause the green is harder to convert, but for the, yeah. for the shooter's eye, green is a, is a easier color to pick up. Yeah. Um, and so from a site of time on target and site reference speed, uh, having a green fiber optic bead out there will, will for some folks, yeah. improve their time on target and put them in the same spot every time um, because obviously the, the actual site itself doesn't change in size or yeah. change in position. So it should look the same, right? If you're looking at a fiber optic bead or a, a rod from the side, it's long. Yeah. It shouldn't look long. Yeah. If you're looking at it from the other side, it looks long again. If you're looking at it head on, it should be just a, a nice dot. circular yeah. bead. And if yeah. you're out in the daylight, it glows. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's lit up. So you're even if you don't get the gun all the way shouldered, you've got the sight referenced yeah. almost before you're ready to yeah. squeeze the trigger. And that's the position I'd like to be in. I'd like to be on my target, know where the barrel is before I'm ever seated. And I know I'm going to make a good shot yeah. once I am. I'm a, that's the, that was the biggest thing that I wanted to try to do on mine is, is change that, get that fiber optic pin on the, the end of my shotgun because I think that'll help out a lot. That being said, there's a guy at a clay shoot a couple days ago. His sight fell off at the first station. Yeah. Uh, and he shot better with no sight yeah. for the rest of the day. Mm. Hmm. I've, I've heard more dudes, clays. <laughs> yeah. I've heard of dudes just cutting their like little bead sights off and run absolutely nothing. That's just, it's know. a great way to reference the target and not the sight. Yeah. 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 You've taken away the, uh, the the crutch as much as a beat can be a crutch. Because in reality, I mean, even with waterfowl hunting, I mean, I, I get it with sandhill cranes, something that's further out, and you're yeah. shooting a mag load uh, that has a lot more velocity than maybe some of the standard loads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You might want to aim because you've yeah. got to be out in front of them a certain amount. Yeah. But for dove and quail, I mean, I'm pretty sure but with no sight, I would shoot just as good, if not better. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe that's something to look at. Just take it off all the way. We need to get you a new shotgun. I need a new shotgun. We got a few. You got a if you got a few. Um, trying yeah, to, I'm trying to help you boys out. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. The upsell. That's the always, upsell. Yeah. Always a solution. New shotgun. Yeah, it's it's not me. It's this gun. <laughs> I try to tell that to my wife. She just doesn't buy it. She's like, I think yours works fine. I'm like, but I need a semi-automatic. She's like, why do you need a semi-automatic? The pump works fine. I'm like, because the pump is not as fun as a semi-automatic. So you just need to buy a new shotgun. <laughs> yeah. Get one of our storage lockers over there and just take the shotgun home in parts. And then exactly. Won't even notice that there's one. Just all of a sudden, sudden the there's safe. one there. You're just like, oh. Yeah. Built over time. Exactly. It's like that Johnny Cash song. One piece at a time. Yeah, one piece at a time. <laughs> um, well, uh, I mean, what other what other gun type stuff can we do? Talk about. I've got one we can maybe cover. Sure. Rock so on. Obviously, it's the NRA convention. This, I guess, last weekend? Mm -hmm. This past uh, weekend. This past weekend. And there's a lot of new stuff coming out. And typically the question we get in stores, you know, what's the coolest what's, new thing? Yeah. And if you take the last two years combined, I mean, there have been some cool guns. and There have been some new um, cool things from a lot of the major manufacturers. But nothing that I would say is really groundbreaking. I mean, the guns function the way guns function. Yeah. Uh, suppressors function the way suppressors function. Um, decibel reduction, the different materials people are using, all of that stuff is kind of pushing the envelope there. But I, if someone wanted to hone in on something that I think is really cool that has gotten way better in the last five years but also gotten cheaper is thermal. Okay. And obviously in Texas it's great because it's legal to use thermals for predators and for hogs, and those are the problems. And, but that's the time yeah. of the day or the evening yeah. that you're going to get them. And the best way to do it because nothing can hide from you with a thermal. Yeah. Um, and the, 
the thermal technology, the resolution, it's like TVs, right? You go from <coughs> standard def to, to 1080p to 4K, yeah. and now God knows what they've got out there. Um, but with, with some of this new thermal, 640 core resolution, the processors, um, it is, it's gotten cheaper to acquire them. So somebody yeah. who's shopping a thermal five years ago thought, holy hell, 11 grand, I'm never getting into that. Yeah. Well, now you're talking two, three, four thousand bucks for a, a very good yeah. warrantied thermal um, that can go on multiple gun platforms yeah. and now they can actually sync to your phone via Bluetooth. Yeah. So it creates its own Wi-Fi network. So I'm looking at what my daughter is aiming at when wow, we're hog yeah. hunting and I can tell her, nope, aim left, aim higher. Yeah. I'm watching in real time on my phone. Um, it, it's just, yeah. it's, if something that's pushed far and beyond what other things have pushed in this yeah. industry, um, thermal is, is the way to go. Yeah. I mean, we get yeah. in the whole ballistic side about what these new rounds are doing and, yeah. and just how impressive and repeatable some of these long range cartridges are. Uh, but thermal for the everyday hunter is the coolest thing to hit our industry. I mean, yeah. certainly in the last two to three years, it's where you've seen the most progression um, and cost reduction because that's ultimately what I'm looking for. Yeah. Not even as a retailer, as a consumer. Yeah. I want the best, the cheapest. Yeah, exactly. And so, mm -hmm. Something that's eleven grand, I'm not even looking at that. I mean, that's yeah. a new car. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now it's actually you know the same as as a high end scope or yeah. a rifle or something that may have been purchased previously. You can almost justify that expense, well, especially mean, after you use one. Yeah. Because now I don't think we'll ever go hunt after nine p.m. without one. Yeah. Um, and now we know just how many squirrels, rats, well, and stuff going are in on? the field. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You can do cattle counts with them. You can now do your deer survey with yeah. them. Because you can get accurate counts. And, I mean, you can – some of the resolution on these things, I mean, you can count the number of hairs on a hog's face yeah. with some of these things. It's I've, – I've gone on one hunt with them, and you're right. They're just – it's the way to go. Oh, you know? it'll spoil the yeah. hell out of you. Yeah, exactly. You'll never use a green light or a, a we, night vision yeah. ever again. Yeah, exactly. we, have, we have one night vision that uh, our buddy has that we pass around when we go hog hunting. And, uh, That's nice, but – Yeah, it's nice. We He even wants thermal. Oh, yeah. Let's, there's really no comparison anymore. There used to be because of the price difference, but now yeah. that the the um, thermals have become competitive price-wise, yeah. and you look at the two next to each other, um, yeah. it's yeah, night, night and day. Night and day. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay. I, I was going to use that. I see what you did there. We'll use it <laughs> since we're there. Um, and just the ability to record the hunts. I mean, yeah. even for us, just being able to show you know customers, hey, look, we were out hunting. This is this is our footage. This isn't yeah. some marketing mm -hmm. thing yeah. that's been edited to to show uh, you yeah. exactly it's this is this is real time this yeah. is what it looks like and the clarity we're getting off these things um is is amazing and yeah. even some of the new ones now with some of the range finding technology yeah we, we were out and i forget what what range they were at when we first started but after we walked we were able to walk within 30 yards and it was across a field to i don't know 30 or 40 hogs mm -hmm. in a corner because that is the one downside to thermal you lose all depth perception you do mm -hmm. so how do you make an accurate shot at 200 yards with a thermal when you don't know you're at 200 yards? And so yeah. part of the technology piece that we're talking about that's being progressed is now the built-in range finders. Yeah. So your crosshair's on the thing. You hit the range finder, and it's going to tell you how far you are. And now a lot of them have three or four different, um, like, distance settings. So program one could be your 50-yard dope for a subsonic 300 yeah. blackout. Program two is your 100-yard dope for Sonic. Yeah. And you got your 200, two or 250-yard dope and your 400-yard dope. And all you do, it's a quick menu, and you just toggle to the distance that you are. Um, and um, the change takes all of four seconds. Yeah. Um, and you've got all these profiles. Not only that, but you can put four different guns for one scope. Yeah. And as long as you're putting it on the same spot each time, obviously, we always want people to verify their zero. Sure. Uh, but in theory, just click gun to gun and you just go to the pro the next profile whichever profile matches up yeah. with that gun which is a really cool and now i mean thermal you can use it during the day yeah and it's really effective thing. during the day i yeah. just switch over to black hot instead of white hot yeah um and again nothing can hide from you yeah exactly you see it all um it's pretty neat be careful though you'll never go back it's like cutting with a suppressor once you're not you're not going back no yeah, driving a friend that has a suppressor and you can't get one our, our, our same buddy with the night vision has suppressors, and I've shot his, and I'm like, man, it's so bad. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a much easier process now. Yeah. And we, we utilize one of the silencer shop kiosks here. So fingerprint, photo, all of that can be done on site, um, and it's all electronically filed. 
So you're not having to go get FBI fingerprint ink done, yeah. go to Walgreens, get a passport photo, then come up here and do six forms yeah. that are all the same. It's all filed electronically. Um, and we're, I think we're seeing average times at around six and a half, seven months, seven and a half. Oh, wow. The, the wait time's extended a little bit because of the shutdown. Yeah. Um, but before that, we were actually, it was going down, down, down. Yeah, they were getting faster. Down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. come down again. Yeah, I was going to ask what what that was because last time I heard people were saying it was about a year wait. It got up actually past a year. I think the longest one we had in the last two years was fifteen months. Gosh. Um, and then it got down to where we were. Hell, one of them was three months. I have no idea how that happened. It was a Just very put, got put on the right person's desk yeah. in the right very part of the stack. Extreme skew mm-hmm. on that one. Um, and then they were getting down six and seven pretty consistent. And then we got back out to like I said we're. We're averaging eight to ten right now. Awesome. Well, I have one last question for you. How's Game of Thrones going to end? Hmm. I think Arya's on the throne. You the think Arya's on the throne? Yeah. I mean, we're gonna, somebody's got to die tonight, yeah. right? I mean, so exactly. Typically, since we haven't had any major deaths in the last two, it's there's there's gonna be a couple up. tonight, yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see. I, I I like your 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 theory of Arya, especially because she's with. Uh, spoiler alerts. Yeah. Um, spoiler if, alert, yeah. everybody. But uh, if you're, uh, I mean, with the the Baratheon thing now, so totally they're they're it, together. It's gonna be awesome. Yeah. So I'm 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 quite looking forward to it. That Sorry, and, Matt. Um, what is Game of Thrones? Don't worry. Yeah, about I'm, it. I'm with you, man. Yeah. <laughs> That in the Deadwood movie. He's waiting till he has the flu or pneumonia to start it, so he can do it all in one sitting. Oh my God, one sitting—that's that's aggressive. Yeah, it's that's aggressive. very aggressive. Um, well, man, we—I can't thank you guys enough for for letting us invade your space. And, Thanks for having us. Um, you know, yeah. and for for joining us and helping us out. So we'll do it again. Absolutely, oh, yeah, man. This was great. And is there anything else you guys want to close with? Yeah. Anything cool so. coming uh, happening at the shop soon? Uh, Tuesday, we've got uh, STI coming in for kind of an impromptu range day. If you okay. want to come see all the STI's new pistols and get to shoot them, uh, meet oh, well. some of the STI reps. That'll be Tuesday evening uh, here at Defender Outdoor Shooting Center. Okay. Um, for anybody wanting to check us out or learn more about us, um, we're DefenderOutdoors.com, and okay. we're on Instagram at Defender Outdoors. Awesome. Rock on, man. Well, Matt, Will, thank you guys very much. And uh, everybody, thanks for listening, and make sure to – Give us a review and subscribe to the podcast. I'm going to go look at red dots. Me too. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.